I almost feel dumb asking this, but how seriously should I take those four weeks of training? Am I like in it to win it? Hold on, these four weeks? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think this is like, this is where you put the hay in the barn, I yeah. feel like, for quarterfinals. It I'm a center in the NBA, and I'm shooting th uh, threes against Steph Curry. It's like you cannot expect <laughs> to make threes like Steph Curry. Yeah. But when the game comes to me and the ball's on the block, then I should be able to make layups. Yeah. And so the same thing is like if you're a strong athlete and you're, you're, you're big, then it's okay if you suck at burpees and dumbbell snatches, especially yeah. in that environment where yeah. no matter how fit you are, you are not going to beat someone that's five foot seven. Yeah. I'm going to keep that little rant in yeah. there. <laughs> yeah. That's a good That's one. That's true. There, I actually, are, is, are we yeah, on? we're going, we're going. So I saw, actually speaking of reacts things, I saw like a Wad Science thing with Yelly Hosty and I, the guy who owns Wad Science, and he was saying they did research on the open and the number one predictor of performance above everything else, above VO2 max, above max strength, above everything, was your anthropometrics. Well, makes so sense, right? it was basically like thigh and arm length. If they were short, you perform well in the open. Yeah. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. My arm length, I have the NBA ape in <laughs> index, yeah. whatever yeah. number that is. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Too well, long. Ye Yelly Hosty, like, I don't think would have qualified for semifinals last year through with the open standards this year. I think he was like 44th in the region in the open but then he finished 10th at the games so right. he had like the widest discrepancy but he's also a big tall yeah. european so, so that's that's the, the thing like if you're doing 90 dumbbell snatches and 90 burpees over a dumbbell so everyone can stay really low the smaller athlete even if they're not as fit is going to go faster just because they're using or losing using fewer distance <laughs> whatever <laughs> yeah, right. well, perfect. you sounded real smart yeah. so, <laughs> brandon's not moving yeah, less yeah, yeah. Uh, so that's my excuse right so for not doing as good but since they lowered that's, the number that's top, not, we're not giving you that excuse. top, top 25 percent, i still make it anyway and now here's my question for you boys are you in yeah i'm in oh, nice so wait why did you use wink? <laughs> because i haven't done it yet but as of this recording <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Yeah, yeah, that's right i yeah. forgot I we forgot. got a couple more hours now chris is gonna go I get himself this in. part out <laughs> um all right so but because i qualified uh my question for you guys is how much time do i actually have to train train before quarterfinals train train yeah there are four weeks as of today in in our online program we already started our quarterfinal prep so this is a monday when we're filming this you're gonna put it out on a monday last day of the open we're gonna train for four weeks and then that weekend of the fourth week will be an aggressive taper going into the week of quarterfinals which starts on wednesday so we'll probably get floor plans on monday of that week of quarterfinals and then basically what we do we tell all our athletes hey look we're not going to write anything for monday and tuesday until we get those floor plans and then once we get those we're going to adjust the training based Based on what we see and then obviously we'll go into quarterfinals yeah some of the or at least how i look at it, some of the training was the open the yeah. open helped people get that maximal intensity the anxiety it's different movements and i think based on what we've heard from boz it's going to be different in terms of the testing structure of quarterfinals but that was kind of like a ramp up and now it's i think of it like okay, it's quarterfinal peaking time now you're going from what you saw in the open where you were doing just one workout you can go full at it, and if you need to repeat it to make a cut line, you can rest a couple days. Now it's, let's say, six workouts, somewhere between four and six workouts that are going to come out. You have six days to do them. So at the minimum, you're doing six workouts over six days. Most likely people are going to repeat them. So it's kind of like this four weeks is the volume tolerance training and the more complexity and the heavier type loading that comes out at quarterfinals. Okay, I got lots of questions about how we'll train during that time or how we should train. But first off, there's going to be multiple groups. Like there's going to be people like me who I just, I'm, I'm not very serious with CrossFit. It was like, hey, I squeaked in and I can do these workouts and maybe I want to so that's a question, like for people who are like me, like you performance wise, or like you psychologically. Well, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no I don't know if there's many of those out there. Because <laughs> you you have the people who are really trying to make it to go to quarterfinal or uh, to semifinals rather. Yeah. But then there's going to be another group who have no chance, and they know that heading into it. Sh how how should that group um, approach quarterfinals? Should they take it seriously? And do you have a recommendation? Should they? Some people might be on the fence right now, like, uh, I got to pay another entry fee. It's going to be another weekend of hard workouts. Like, talk me in or out of wanting to do it. Pros and cons. You go, you go first. Well, yeah. I think the first thing is, is that people already sign up for the open because they love getting on the leaderboard. And this is another opportunity. Like if you think about it, and this is like one of the main competitions throughout the year, you just train for 10 and a half months to get to the open. And then you did the open. It's like, 
okay, it's over. Well, <laughs> if you get in the quarterfinals, you get another opportunity to get after and do something that you love. And so that's my encouragement. The other thing too, is for those that maybe are more focused on off season competitions, it's still a great way to practice the skill of competing, which is kind of to your point with the open. That's what we yeah. use it as is practice for quarterfinals and quarterfinals can be practiced for other off season competitions. Yeah. The open didn't really give people the best opportunity to prep for like, you don't need to submit a video. You right. can, you know, the, the standards and all of that stuff are not as tight as when you get to quarterfinals because there's no objective review process. Normal affiliates are doing it. So I think if you're actually trying to get better at competing, you should do quarterfinals because it is an opportunity to really replicate what a real competition is like. It's not in person, but it gives you the multiple events. You have time pressure to do it. There's not as much of an ability to kind of like mess up and just start over. You have to really put your best foot forward. There is that it sounds like time frame wise, you can still do repeats, but yeah. it still requires a little bit more like you have to execute in the moment. So if you are striving to be a competitor, I would say do it with 100% certainty. CrossFit might not like me saying this, but I think if you're just a class member and you were like fighting in the class structure to make it to quarterfinals, but you really have no desire to compete in the sport, then it might not make sense for you to do. But for anybody that has serious recreational competitor desires like you want to go to these competitions you want to get into Wadapalooza or TFS even if it's just for fun even if it's for fun even if you're not a professional athlete I would say do it like it's part of the experience of shared suffering and improving your ability to execute under pressure the workouts in the open they kind of suck relative to what an in-person competition is like you're not doing a 20 minute AMRAP usually at an in-person competition. They're more intense, they're heavier, the skills are higher, they're more exciting. So we know that even the workout structure of what we see in the open doesn't always translate to being good at the sport of CrossFit. Yeah. And there's always the best of the best do well in the open semis and the games, but there's tons of people that don't do well in the open and then do well at semifinals or quarterfinals in the games. So I would say do it. Yeah. So it sounds like for the group who's not going to go to semifinals, one of the big, big takeaways is like, Hey, it's going to be good practice uh, at competing that you're not going to be able to just fake on a random idle Tuesday, yeah. you know, apps and all this stuff. What, what besides that is another good goal. So for, for that camp, a group of people, what's a good goal heading into quarterfinals? Ooh, that's interesting. So the goal for that group is not have one. Yeah. I mean, yes, I would, I would think that if you're participating in a sport recreationally have some goals, even if they're process goals, I think for that group, it's more important to not have pure leaderboard goals only. I think having goals about how you prepare for things like Becky and Tracy, for example, doing this group nutrition peaking structure and they're focusing on sleep hydration food and all that uh it, it's basically a program that they're doing to help people peak for quarterfinals focusing on oh, the, the nutrition non stuff. yeah nutrition yeah. related things we do it in training with just the training structure but also supporting those kind of lifestyle variables outside having process orientation things of like, okay, are you doing all of the things to take care of your body so you can be peaked on game day? Are you doing all the things in training that are going to replicate what you're going to see on game day? And having things about prog progress, consistency, hitting, if there's a one rep max, hitting a certain percentage of your one rep max while under pressure, those types of things, I feel like, I don't know, if, maybe for me now, like i play golf recreationally or do martial arts recreationally or play table tennis and having those things and actually executing, I think makes me feel really happy. And that is something that you can get if you actually put yourself invested into something versus just being like, Oh, well I made it. I'm going to jump into it. Yeah. Or the opposite. Like I had, and this was in the open, but I had a pair of shoes come untied and that failure was going to sting big enough that next time I won't, that won't happen again. Whereas again, going back to, if it was an idle Tuesday, I don't care as much. Don't not thinking about it. Brandon, what about you? Yeah. I mean, I, I always think about three things. One is effort and then execution and then improvement. And oh, so like why couldn't it be an E? <laughs> no, it's not. Yeah, yeah, yeah sorry. E's. Triple E's. Hold on, what <laughs> improvement doesn't start with an E? Yeah, improvement. E is improvement. there any improvement? E improvement. E improvement. For improvement. Yeah. So effort is just obviously the next four weeks is someone is peaking for quarterfinals, giving their best effort. And that doesn't mean just training hard. It means being focused on the things they need to get better at, which Max and I, I think, will talk. I'm sure you'll ask that question. Like, what should you be training for right now? The execution side. Not anymore. <laughs> yeah, he's not going to ask it. 
the execution side is making sure that you know how to properly pace and then execute within the workout based on your own expectations, where your skill level actually is. And so what I mean by that is like some people go into a workout and there's 30 muscle-ups at the end of it, and maybe you don't have muscle-ups. You can't expect to get those, but can you get there and at least give some honest attempts at those muscle-ups? And so making sure you're executing based on your skill level. And then the improvement side, this it does kind of come down to the leaderboard max, where if you've done quarterfinals in the past, it's a good way to compare your scores from one year to the next year. And now, Here's the thing, though. Sometimes you get worse on the leaderboard, even though you got better. So you still need to be able to kind of step back. And we talked about this at the very beginning of the podcast. Like that first workout in the Open this year, people are really frustrated by their scores. But if you're a six foot three guy that weighs 220 pounds, even if you're, quote unquote, more fit than someone that's smaller than you, it's going to be really hard to beat them in that workout. So if certain styles or certain movements come out in quarterfinals and you don't do well, you just need to be object objective about, did I get better at these things and it's just a really bad workout for me? Or did I underperform or did I not execute well? So those are the three things I look at. Yeah, that's part of the reason why I don't really like performance-based goals yeah. for more recreational competitors because the tests change every year. But I hear what you're saying. I think it's important... If you are participating in a sport, it is important to make sure that you are making progress. Personally, I just don't feel that just the quarterfinals totally. is a great marker of progress. But it could be one of the variables that, I guess, holds you focused. I yeah. talked to an athlete yesterday, and I think they, they framed it really, really well. He wasn't looking at the leaderboard. He was looking at the amount of muscle-ups he did in that last workout compared to how many muscle-ups he got last year. And mm -hmm. every workout's different, but he's like, that was a PR for the amount of muscle-ups. I got t over 21 muscle-ups where last year I was really struggling with them. And so even though maybe his placing on the leaderboard's the same, he crushed his previous PR in an actual testing environment that there was pressure. And so I think that's a cool way to look at yeah, it. Yeah, those are the types of goals that I think are important to set for – the Chris correlates that are listening that are going to do core quarterfinals. It's like set yourself some targets that actually set you up for success and executing that aren't just, uh, you know, make into the top thousand or whatever yeah. that is. Cause sometimes that can be hard to a hard to predict. Like you saw with our predictions in the open, there's so many things happening the way CrossFit calculates multiple workouts coming out it's very hard to know if a workout comes out, how fast do you need to go on this one specifically to make sure you finish in the top thousand. So I think sometimes the leaderboard can be a good thing to look at after it's all said and done to be like, oh, okay, I'm proud of where I finished on the leaderboard. But in the moment, I think setting process goals or setting things that are important to you that a, make you happy, and B, make you feel like you got better from all of the effort that you put in to get here. I think that's kind of the goal to keep you motivated at this yeah. point. We often hear the haze in the barn. So I think a lot of people at this point are going to be wondering, can I, should I be getting stronger at this point? If there's a skill I need to acquire or like clean up, uh, is now the time? Like, how do you view that stuff? I mean, I think the haze in the barn is a statement that you put like the week of the competition. Yeah. Like you get there and you're like, all right, you know, I say the money's in the bank. Like you're not going to build fitness in that time, but a month out three weeks of really good, high quality training. We're putting a simulation into training where you can actually practice. You got to practice in the open, the maximal intensity, but it's not multiple max intensities of different things back to back, but getting some practice of that for the recovery, a lot of skills didn't come out in the open. So muscle ups didn't come out. Pistols didn't come out. Handstand hand push hand pushups, hand walk. wall walks. Like there's so many things that probably got a little bit under trained over the course of the last week that I do actually think you can get better. I just made out with my, uh, <laughs> did you see it? Time, my yeah. lip just well, for raised instance, my, if I don't have mic. one of those skills at all. Like right now I, I could barely do a pistol. Is that something I should try to worry about or just say, you know what? I'm probably not going to get that in the next little while. Maybe what, what do you say? I would try. I would say you do your base training. Like you, in our example, with you following Compete, you do your base training program, which will have some of that stuff in it anyways. Yeah. But then grab the, a skill program. They're in there. Grab a pistol skill program and add two days a week of extra work to the things that you think are for sure weaknesses yeah. because you could get it. I mean, how much time have you put into the cultivation a of a pistol? No, no. Yeah, zero. And that's <laughs> true. Well, that's true for most people that were just bubble getting into the top 75%. It's like, all right, well, most of that group of people is training to have some muscle and be healthy and have VO2 max, but they're not really like caring about the sport per se. But this is an opportunity for you to compartmentalize that and say, okay, 
okay, well, now I care a little bit more. There's going to be a leaderboard. These things are going to come out. Let me put a little bit of effort into it because if you do have those skills, even in a low number, like you have muscle ring muscle ups and they come out and they come out in a progressive way, usually one is a big deal or yeah. pistols comes out and you can do them. If it's later in the workout, let's say it goes like wall balls, walking lunges, and then pistols at the end of the workout. Generally speaking, if you can do a couple of them, it's hundreds of places on the leaderboard. So I'd say it's worth it if you're doing it. Okay. If you don't think it's worth it, I would say, well, don't do quarterfinals. Yeah, this is actually something that we sat down as coaches and really kind of try to flesh out how we were going to put it into the program in a four-week period. Or Really, we started this before the Open, to Max's point. But we said, okay, we're going to set up our base building program or our base program, which is going to make sure we take care of all the common movements. And then we know that there are some people like you, Chris, or like me that struggle with something like a pistol where we need some extra work. And so then we built in these extra credit programs that include things like pistols and GH and rope climbs and handstand pushups, all of the things that will likely be tested in quarterfinals as optional things that people can do throughout the training week. So someone could do their regular training program and they're like, oh, I need to get better at pistols and GHDs. They can plug them right into the training. And even if you're not following our program, people can do that on their own. Like, look at the things that you know you don't have. I haven't done GHDs in three months. You better start practicing those now over the next four weeks because they probably will come out and it'll probably be like, 150 in quarterfinals. So you don't <laughs> yeah. want to get rhabdo and then have issues the rest of the weekend. Well, actually, let's back up a little bit. I know I sent us down that path, but let's say last year, what was the gap between the open ending and quarterfinals beginning? There were two training weeks, and then it was the week of quarterfinals. Okay. So the advantage now is you get four training you get weeks. Four weeks. So how did y'all as coaches, when y'all said, okay, we got four weeks, what are the big changes? What are the things that you get to do differently? And how did y'all go about setting that up? We actually, we already had a plan in place because we knew what quarterfinals would look like. But one of the things that we said as coaches is we want to see what comes out in the open because that will probably tell us what is likely to come out in quarterfinals. In other words, Max already said this. You didn't see handstand walks. You didn't see wall walks. You didn't see handstand push-ups or handstand walks or bar pullovers or pirouettes or all of these skills that they've tested over the last couple of years, crossover singles, crossover doubles, that may now, it's a higher likelihood that they'll come out in quarterfinals. So we bias the program toward those movements that haven't been tested while still keeping in some of those commonly tested movements like thrusters and bar muscle-ups because there's a chance still that you see those two movements in quarterfinals. So the first thing is, is we take all of these and we have a full like spreadsheet that we use that basically is a Nerds. movement checklist. I mean, it is, dude, it is y'all nerdy. spreadsheets are out of control. <laughs> oh, dude. You, you, open these, <laughs> you open these things and it, it it's like back, you're back in like Windows 95 <laughs> and it takes like 10 hours to boot up there's because a lot. there's so <laughs> much happening. There's a lot of information. We started splitting it so yeah. that it goes a little bit faster. Yeah. But yes. There's a lot of tabs and then there's a oh. lot of, even within a training day, there's like multiple training cells and notes in there. <laughs> it can be overwhelming. Got to keep ourselves organized. <laughs> um, but yeah, we, we use that movement checklist list to then build out a training program. And then we reverse engineer it. We got four weeks and then we know we have the train, the actual co competition week. So then what in those four weeks, how do we progress people to get better, Chris, at pistols or at handstand walks or handstand pushups? And then we build a program off of that. What was the original question? How does training differ? I was just wondering how you, how you actually, you, if you say, Hey, we, we know we have four weeks. How do you actually go about setting up the best possible scenario? And like, what is the best possible scenario since you know it? Yeah. Four weeks, and you and like Brandon said, maybe you know that these movements are more likely. What? How do you go about yeah. setting it up? So I think most of it, there, there's a little bit of a predictive element. Like we know the open was super simple, super light. E, e, there was no like real lifting under fatigue, no one rep maxes. So there's got to be some structure to the strength. Not necessarily right now in terms of driving one RMs up in an individual lift, but making sure that you can hit your one RMs under fatigue that you can be tired and hit 80% for multiple reps if it's something like heavy clean and jerk and box jump overs. So there's making sure that you have variance in all of those things, complexes. So that's part of the strength structure. There's the like psychology or physiology of actually preparing for the competition itself, which is multiple events over multiple days. So there's a simulation that is, is it next weekend? It's April 5th through the 7th. April 5th through the 7th. So, so that's, what week in the four week buildup is that? I think that's second, week two. Yeah. Week yeah. Two. It's actually the same week as team. And when you say finals. simulation, what does that mean? So we wrote, we, we made it a, a quasi simulation. We wrote four different tests and the tests are supposed to be simu simulating what we expect the quarterfinals test to look like and feel like. So making sure that there's progressive weight elements in them because Boz has already come out and said that 
they know that top 75th percentile is not, I don't want to be offensive to you, but your level of athleticism relative to a semifinal athlete is very, very, very wide. So to make a test to incentivize somebody like you to do the workout, it can't start with 225 pound snatches. So to solve that problem, basically they're saying, okay, well, if we do snatches, it'll be lighter snatches and then heavier and then heavier, and then it'll get up to a weight that you can't do, but the elites can do. So we write tests like that in a format where you have to do multiple of those tests over a number of days so you can practice a the styles of workouts b the recovery and then the other intangible things or maybe they are tangible but setting up your camera filming them having a floor plan having a layout doing it under pressure feeling a leaderboard of other people yeah. doing it just those things to get ready for and like crunching that all into a weekend the That's exactly yeah. The, yeah. yeah the stress so we do that and as we've been a, doing that for how many years now this will be our fourth year this is a third, third, third quarterfinal year. And what's the third overall quarterfinal year, but probably 10 years. Cause I've run yeah, simulations, simulations with individual pre-comps, athletes, yeah. and pre-comps we've got all lots of videos on that. Yeah. But for, as far as quarterfinal goes, how has that been in the past years? Like what's the big, what do you feel like the big takeaway people get out of that is? I, I think just like any other sport, th- those athletes will scrimmage before big games. You want to practice in full speed, exactly what it's going to be like. You want to practice all of your plays. You want to have a halftime where you cool down and then you warm back up and do it again. It's the same thing here. It's like you're going to practice setting up your camera like Ma- Max said. You're going to get like under the pressure. Order. The, all, yeah, the, uh-huh. the order. How to, how to order your workouts. How are you going to eat that day? How are you going to cool down after a workout, warm back up for a workout? Like all of those little details. It's easy to say – okay, I got an idea of how to do it until you get into it. It's like, what does Mike Tyson always say? Yeah. Everyone can talk trash until they get punched in the face or something Everyone's like that. Everyone's got a plan. Until a plan, yeah, th- that's true, right? And you get in the middle of a workout. He's about like, to get oh. punched in the face by what? <laughs> Jake uh, Paul. Yeah. yeah. We got to watch Wait, that. is that real? <laughs> yeah. Can we order that? I heard that there's like really, this is such a tangent, but I heard there's really whack rules to it and that they got leaked that there's like certain things that they can't hit each other in certain places. So or who's like winning? Let's put our money where our mouth is right here. I don't in know, the middle man. of a quarterfinals <laughs> Mike, Mike Tyson, I would never I fight hope, him. I hope Mike Tyson wins. But he's 57. Yeah, he's getting old. And Jake Paul's like a good athlete. What's Think crazy is, have you seen the that. meme going around? where? Because I didn't. I never knew how he became so famous. I always knew he was like a YouTube celebrity or something, but I didn't. I never knew his background. But then now people are putting out memes of him like doing Dancing. like TikTok videos as a young kid. Yeah. And it says something like, this is the guy Tyson's fight. Yeah. you can, you got to respect the hustle, though. Yeah, oh, yeah, for I sure. I mean, hey, yo, who's, what's his brother? Logan. Yeah, he that, saw him. Yeah, at he's WWE. awesome in WWE. That dude's good on the mic. Anyway, sorry. Back to quarterfinals. <laughs> <laughs> Brandon's <laughs> having a heart attack. What are we doing here? <laughs> uh, enjoy, folks. Enjoy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, I thought it was good. Yeah. Yeah. I forgot what our question was. Yeah, I do do. I do. You do do. You do do. <laughs> I do do. I do do. I do do my pants. Do do. Uh, we're talking about the simulation. Yeah. What about it though? Yeah, I mean, I, again, you were saying it, everyone it, has a plan until they get punched in the face. Right. So you need to actually get into a simulation halfway through the weekend. You're sore. You're a little beat up. But you still have to perform in another workout. So you get a warm up again. Your warm ups may change because you are sore or something's maybe a little tweaky. Getting all of that practice does matter. And then having some downtime after a simulation so that you can recover and then properly peak for the actual competition. And yeah. that's built into the training. That's built that's into the training. That's not like, hey, separate. Yeah, it's completely built in the training. And the cool thing, too, is that we're going to treat it like it actually is quarterfinals. So we're going to give, like, workout orders. We'll have basic floor plans for everyone. And then we'll also have full warm-ups and cool-downs for athletes. Why did you say semi or quasi? uh, You said quasi. Oh, we don't know what the – We don't know how many workouts there are, and we just made the decision. How many were there last year? There were five. Five? Five. Yeah, and they there were five it? with multiple scores, or was it just five? I think it was just five. It was just five. Have they yeah. announced any major differences for this year? No, just well, longer. Uh, yeah, just longer. And I think there's still. I heard longer in, is it the window yeah, to do them. Is six longer? days to do it, which I actually think means for all you Death. quarterfinals people that it, a we're dying as a staff trying to keep up with it. But I think it means almost everybody's repeating multiple workouts. Yes. Yeah. So I think it'll be a very high pressure high volume weekend to do well in Excel. And that is, so you made the comment, like the hay is in the barn. If you told me, like, ask me honestly, is somebody in the 80th percentile going to put 15 pounds on their one rep max to from now to quarterfinals? I'd be like, no, but 
those intangible Hot things take. of yeah, yeah. <laughs> recovery, psychology of doing that type of work, getting volume of all the quarterfinal skills while being under fatigue. Those types of things are adaptations that can happen in a really short period of time. Well, at least so, make some improvements. Yeah. Exactly. So we do think that you can get better and that there should be structure at this time of the year to get better. We have a more strength and conditioning approach, I think, to sport. So like we have big off seasons where we try to get people more focused on hypertrophy and low intensity endurance. And then we build up through the year. And now is the time where it's like, okay, let's do some more sport practice and make sure that by the time the quarterfinals comes and the sports being tested, you have trained like an athlete in the sport. Yeah. And you talked about this and, and Max, I think you kind of covered the the progressive loading that you may see. But the other thing that we're thinking about is not only just like styles of workouts, but time domains mm -hmm. too. We did see maybe a really short sprint in the open and then a longer 20 minute AMRAP. In quarterfinals, they've typically had most of their workouts between like that seven and 12 minute mark or eight to 14 minute mark. And then one really long one. So we're also going to really test short one too, and right? one really short one too. So we're, we're going to test all of those throughout the training weeks as we go through. Um, and then the other thing is it's not, may not just be progressive loading so like you may see a light barbell and moderate barbell a heavy barbell where maybe chris, uh, the chris doesn't get to but uh, travis does you're also going to see complexity in gymnastics kind of similar to what you saw in the last open workout where it was chest to bars into bar muscle ups you may see something where it's just pull up to chest to bar to ring muscle up or toe to ring to ring muscle up like these things where the complexity gets a little bit higher as you go through a workout with gymnastics and so we want to we want to make sure that we're also practicing that in both emom format or interval format and testing throughout the training week um, I guess the next question that someone like me or <laughs> anybody really would have is, and I think you mentioned it at the beginning is, so we got the training, but how should I be, th should I try to peak for this? Meaning, sh is there a point of time where I'm trying to back off or time it just right so that I'm at my absolute best or is this... Yeah, I mean, yes, and we build the training to help you peak. Yeah. So it's basically f four weeks of training with the week two being the biggest peak in terms of simulating the competition. And then the week of is basically the taper week based like volume drops. They won't write it and there won't be structure to it until we get floor plans and kind of have an understanding. But that's basically your peaking structure is basically a build and then a big drop off right before. And what is that? Uh, like just explain just on a low level, like why is the drop off actually end up helping? Yeah, and like because some people will keep plowing through, and yeah, how did you learn that over the years that this isn't the way? <laughs> yeah, I mean CrossFit, I think has a, uh, like I don't know, almost like a anti peaking mindset sometimes, where more is people better. just like getting after it exactly, yeah. and it that what we found is there are certain athletes that that can be successful for. Generally speaking, it's like the 0.00001% of the elite that I can was just say, you just said that everything. Now everyone's <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the other yeah. percent. They're like, gonna I'm hear then. Like, That's me. I know. Can you beep it out from before? <laughs> but for, damn it, I lost my train of thought. You said there's the 0.000% who can handle it. Oh, handle the volume. But for most people, they're not, able to do that in training and they end up going in with sore joints or low energy. So generally speaking in all sports, in all endurance sports, in all powerlifting, in all weightlifting, there's a period of time where you're trying to maximize your fitness. But while you're maximizing your fitness, you're also maximizing your fatigue because you're doing a lot of training. So your energy levels are depleted. Your glycogen is depleted. Like all of these things that get depleted when you do hard training ramp up fatigue. And the goal of building a peak is trying to get the fitness as maximal as you possibly can and then pull the fatigue down so that you feel fresh and you have mm -hmm. high energy. So that's really the scientific framework for doing that everybody operates a little bit different in terms of how they do it but generally speaking somewhere anywhere from seven to 14 days out is where most peaking in most sports happens in this sport i don't think you can go to 14 because i think you decondition the yeah. movements too much so generally we make it the week of and the week of means it's usually like a four to seven day strong taper for people yeah, so what does that week look like <clears throat> So the week before, we are going to have a Monday and Tuesday. It's a pretty hard session. So you can imagine that you're eight days out from the start of quarterfinals. It's, you're still going pretty hard. And this Monday and Tuesday, Monday, the, Tuesday week the week before. So yeah. eight days away. And then on that seventh day out, on that Wednesday is when we will start an aggressive taper. Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Monday, Tuesday 
are all going to be lower volume, but we'll still have some intensity. So the act, in fact, the intensity will actually be pretty high on Friday and Saturday. We'll be having, we'll have short, fast, kind of what we call stinger style workouts where you're still getting touches on some of the movements that we think will come out. We still want to practice all the skills. So like if you're working on pistols, you're working on handstand walk, you're working on ring muscle ups, you'll get some really light touches on those with some speed, but the volume is going to be really low. We actually reduce the volume anywhere from like 40 to 70% during those days. So if you're used to doing, let's just say 30 muscle ups in a session, you may only do six to eight muscle ups in a session, but we want those to be really crisp, really fast. You feel good and confident, but you can walk into that next week to Max's point, feeling good. And I just want to kind of touch back on that because everyone's experienced this, right? You go into the, the, the gym, and you feel great on a day, and you know it in your warm up. Like, I think I can hit a PR today. That's the way we want you to feel. And the opposite of that, and everyone's done this too, you walk into the gym and you know you want to train, but you're like, man, even the bar feels heavy. Or you get it into your front rack and you can't get the bar down to your shoulders. Like, <laughs> that's and, me every day. That's what I'm saying. But <laughs> people get to that point in training, and, and in the off season, maybe that's okay. You, you want to maximize fatigue a little bit so that you can kind of like, you know, hit that stress point where you actually adapt. But now we're trying to make sure that that fatigue is as low as possible. Yeah. It's not. I, we do it in a way to set you up for success, but it's never a guarantee. You might end up even with a perfect taper showing up and feeling sure. that bad way. But the, the point is that we've done it for a really long period of time and built kind of like, hey, this is a best practice for getting peaked for game day. I started with my like Travis in the early days being the only elite that I was coaching. I was using basically like the science of endurance training to build peaking structure. So two weeks out, I'd start to taper volume. Then we'd get into the competition. What ended up happening is like, he's like, I haven't done a muscle up in, uh, in a, in a fatigue setting in 20 days because we did it basically the week before the two-week taper and he hadn't been at max heart rate and max respiration so the first workout of a competition would be a major shock to his system and I'd be like oh man I'm gonna mess this up so over time we realized oh the the taper needs to start later during the taper we need to make sure there's still some intensity to make sure you're breathing hard and you're at max effort you don't want to be doing a one rep max snatch on Monday before the competition generally speaking you want to make sure that there's some structure to that taper. So there's some intensity, some things get pulled down intensity, total volume drops. And the goal of all of that stuff is to get to the competition with that, like, oh, I'm ready yeah, to go I feel type good. feel You're on the fired first up. day. Yeah. yeah, yeah totally. You got all your glycogen restored because you ate a little bit more carbs. You had less training hours. So maybe you got an extra hour of sleep leading into the competition. Sometimes you don't because you're anxious. Dopamine levels <laughs> yeah. are back up. Yeah, just like all of those things are optimized, basically. Yeah. Uh, you have something else? Well, I was just going to say one more thing that we do, and I mentioned this a little bit earlier, is that we also are waiting to hear from CrossFit. So we have templates built out for those last two weeks that we'll use if everything goes according to plan. But let's just say CrossFit gives us a leak or they accidentally leak something <laughs> and you know there's going to be a bunch of ring muscle ups. We may add a little bit of practice in there for that. And the same thing is as floor plans come out, if they release those early, then we adjust the training. We treat it as like we're writing for an individual athlete because we want to give our group program the best best ability to perform. And, uh, okay, well, let me switch real quick. So is there anything during this four week build that I should stop doing? Mm. I would say things that you should stop doing are probably not related to inside the gym. Like if you, in your example, if you want to do quarterfinals and take it seriously, and one day a week you go out with your friends and you have a couple extra beers and you don't get good night of sleep on every Saturday, and that's part of your routine. Those outside lifestyle things, I think, matter a lot more than people think. Like, if you want to recover, for if you just want to do one workout in the open and then you're going out, you're eating pizza, drinking beers, and, like, having fun and not getting a good night of sleep, it's probably not that big a deal. But that cumulative effect, if you're then doing a competition that you have to recover from that workout to do another workout in the afternoon and then potentially repeat those workouts and you have to handle a lot of volume – Things that are almost so basic that athletes hate hearing it, or sometimes high-level athletes don't do them, like hydration, sleep quality, proper nutrition, micronutrition, those things matter. So I would say anything that you're doing that could sabotage your physical performance should be cut out if you can for this last month. Yeah, it's almost a, like going into a training camp. Another yeah. pitch for the simulation. You yeah. said hydration. It's like, well, yeah, well, let's yeah. let's make the hydration mistake during simulation week. Not That is yeah. true. And it's yeah. really easy in CrossFit because 
a crossfitters love caffeine and coffee I, it's like the i mean i guess a society I was at large say, everyone does, does. Yeah. We're all drug addicts. Yeah. Drug. Yeah. but specifically i think for people that have to get high levels of adrenaline multiple times per day their morning coffee pre-workout before each workout like you're ingesting a lot of caffeine which is a diuretic and a lot of people aren't matching that with intake and now it's starting to get a little bit warmer the workouts are getting longer you can lose a lot of water and the the effect of that on a performance state is very 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 scientifically proven that it can kill performance so a lot of times when people have those days that they just show up they're like man, I don't really feel good. If you ask them, what were your habits like over the last three days? Like how much sleep did you get? How much water did you take in with your food? Did you hit all of the food that you were supposed to hit? Like they're so basic, they're almost stupid, but they'll be like, oh, I didn't drink any totally. water yesterday. Well, speaking of that, can you think uh, quarterfinals is what, this is our fourth year we're about to do of quarterfinals? I or think third? it was 2021, yeah. two, three. No, this is, is fourth. fourth? fourth yeah. Okay, so what were the big mistakes looking back that were like, damn, okay, let's clean that up. Anything that sticks out that a lot of people ended up doing? Us or, or athletes? Any, just or in general, athletes, coaching. And it could be any group. Was there anything that stuck out like, man, Okay, a few years of this, this is something that happens a bunch. Mm. It's a little bit different this year because there's a larger gap for training, but I did see a couple years ago when the, you know, you only had a, a really a one-week training turnaround. People would train really hard through the open, train hard through that week and not have that taper. And that is, again, some people can handle it. Like yeah. some high-level athletes can just bounce back and they crush quarterfinals. Most people get really tweaky and then they underperform. So I think that's the one that people need to be careful of. But that's why you just follow a good program. It doesn't has to be, have to be ours. Like someone that no, knows it, it has, has to, to be, be ours. ours. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just Don't in, listen to this and not follow. <laughs> in general, someone should follow a program that allows you to train hard and then properly taper so that you feel good going in the competition. I'm trying to think of other ones. Yeah, I mean, I think the mistakes that are made are – largely driven by how the competition format has been like in year one little things that I didn't take into consideration, like the amount of time that it takes to get the camera framed, set up, make sure that you're ready when the timing, when the athletes ready to be able to walk over and start filming, that can be very disorienting for somebody that wants to do quarterfinals, even recreationally. Like, okay, you go out, all the tape set up, you know, you got your floor plan. Now you're starting to warm up and you're like, Oh, okay, I'm ready to go. Then it's okay. Now you got to film everything. You yeah. got to weigh everything. And that 10, 15 minute period can be very distracting. Yeah. You cool down. So another, like that is another reason to do the simulation, but just some of the basics, like having a camera, having a backup camera, having a judge, having a helper, like all Tying of your the, shoes. yeah, all of the basic stuff I feel like is the most important on site. We hire judges to come well, in with us yeah, like that's crazy because we set all of our stuff up for the athletes and it's just like thinking about all the people out there who they're going to do the workout but they're also the ones setting up their floor plan plan yeah. and they're in gyms that are probably not caring about quarterfinals so they're going to get crammed into space so preemptively thinking about all of that stuff i think is like it's going to set people up really for success if you can do that talk to your gym owner let them know, make sure when you get the floor plans that you go in, talk to the gym owner, make sure you know where it's going to be, that you can map your floor space out. Those little things, I think, can improve performance a lot in this competition because at an in-person competition, all of that is taken care of, and you don't have to stress about anything. You just show up, warm up, go out, you're in your corral, you walk out, three, two, one, go, bam. In this type of a competition, there is a pretty big heavy lift that makes it a big pain in the ass for athletes. So practicing that and having almost like a checklist of things to do, making sure all your stuff is packed, back up, you have a judge, you know your floor plan, all the tape is there, all the tape measures are there for when you have to film it, you have your camera, you have your backup camera, they're both on airplane mode. That sounds almost stupid for like, from at least I feel stupid saying it like, oh, I'm a fitness coach for the sport, <laughs> but you make sure you have your camera and your backup <laughs> camera. But literally, if you do the workout and you don't film it in quarterfinals, that's it. Like you, you have to do it again. But so this goes right back to practice that in the simulation. Exactly. Yeah. Having opportunities to practice everything before the actual event. Yeah. yeah. And you can do it just in general training. Sure. But I think for the simulation, you'll have floor plans, you'll have the leaderboard. It's an actual workout as opposed to being intervals. So it's a really good opportunity to like, hey, do a dry run and see how all of that stuff feels so that 
two weeks later, you know exactly how you want to operate. Yeah. How do you pack your food? What comes with you? What do you do for recovery? If you get really hot in the workout, how do you cool off? Like all of those little intangible things, they add up so much yeah. for performance. All right, last thing. When we switch back to the four weeks leading up, how like I almost feel dumb asking this, but how seriously should I take those four weeks of training? Am I like in it to win it? Hold on, these four weeks? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think this is like... This is where you put the hay in the barn, I yeah. feel like, for quarterfinals. it Open was part of training. Like, our training cycle was kind of open as the first half of it and then the quarterfinals prep as the first half, and it's kind of like one big training block with two little peaks built yeah. into it. But if, let's say, you didn't do that, now is a time where all of the things that could come out in quarterfinals, like multiple tests back-to-back, higher-level skills, progressive skills, the skills that weren't tested. So right now, I'm open. dialing in my sleep. I'm I mean, not I, partying. Yeah, exactly. I'm not, yep. All yeah. that stuff. Yeah. So, for I like mean, the whole four weeks. Yeah. Too. And I mentioned that with uh, Tracy and Becky being like, this This is the time to try to get all the things in line. Just get the training in line, get the food in line, get the hydration. For most people that are not semifinal athletes, this is the season. This is literally where everything is dictated. Where if somebody says, How good are you at the sport of CrossFit? This is the leaderboard that's going to matter. So this would be the time that it's almost like this is your fight camp. This is your preseason. This is where you're actually like, being as serious as you possibly can be. And then once it's over, you get to take it's your break. it's fun to do that. It's yeah, fun to totally. be like, what can I do? What? How can I lock in? You know, Or maybe I struggle with it and overcome it. But yeah. 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 And that, it goes by so fast, too. Like, four weeks is nothing. So, like, enjoy the whole process. Like, you talk about being process-oriented, Max. And this is a great way to say, okay, here's my goal. I just want to crush the next four weeks, go into quarterfinals feeling healthy, and then execute on every single workout. Yeah, I, this is maybe also a cultural statement, and I don't want to be too offensive, but the natural tendency of somebody that's not in athlete mode is over the years, you get a little bit fatter, a little bit less mobile, a little bit less strong. And there's hey, a pretty, you talking to me, bro? <laughs> yeah. And there's this deterioration because uh, at some point, like physical development or sport performance is no longer your focus in life. People start having kids. They start working on a business. They start thinking about financial security when they're not working anymore. And there's just a very natural tendency for us to become less physically capable and less personally invested in our own progress. Having things like this throughout the year where you can dial in can help prevent that regression that just naturally happens. And maybe in our culture happens faster. Like the average 40 year old now is probably way yeah. more deteriorated than a 40 year old back when our society yeah. was a little bit more physical. So I think of it almost like this is a personal development opportunity. One month per year, yeah. you can dial yourself in, get after it, put your best foot forward, then deload and just get back to your normal thing. And if you do that every year, there's probably a net benefit to your longevity and health. Well, also into that exact point is like, if I do this, I feel like even with just the open just now, it's the excitement of it has made me lock in on other things where I'm taking things a little more serious. So yeah, it's just good to do that. So, so speak on that same note, where, where are y'all heading after this? So my season comes to after a screeching what? halt after quarterfinals, uh, like what, what, what for someone like me, what am I doing? You know, for all those people whose season ends, what's next? How should, I be, <laughs> yeah. How should I be thinking about training? Yeah. yeah. I mean, we'll have multiple options because there are so many different levels of athlete. Yeah. And we both, we, we've all talked about different that, right? limiters to right. Like. Totally. Totally. So, you know, within our online program, we'll have all those athletes that qualify for semifinals. They're, they're going right into that. They're, they're prepping for semifinals, but that's such a small group for most of us. It'll be going into an off season phase and some people need to get stronger. So we're going to have three cycles in a row of strength bias work where we're going to try to get you as strong as possible because that still is the biggest separator in the sport. We haven't seen it as much because the open was pretty light, but we're going to see it in quarterfinals and people are going to realize like, oh man, I need to get stronger because those 225 pound squat snatches or 155 pound squat snatches really held me back. I think it actually did affect that it, point it, three. For the thrusters. The thruster yeah, at right 135, 95 definitely slowed people down if they weren't strong enough to just cycle it. Sorry right. to cut yeah, you yeah, off. Yeah, totally. So we'll have that option. And But there are some people like Mike McGoldrick who's already really, really strong, but he wants to work on his endurance. So we have an endurance option, which is we'll start with kind of some lower level endurance where we're still working on making sure that we're building a big aerobic base and then it gets more and more intense as we go throughout the year. But for those athletes that just need to 
to build their endurance, they have that option. And then we also have developmental cycles where we're going to work on all the gymnastic skills. Some people are still going to get exposed, even though they've worked on ring muscle-ups for years, by 30 or 40 ring muscle-ups in a workout. And if that's you, then you have those options in our training I didn't class. mean all the people. I meant me, motherfucker. Oh, okay. What am I supposed to do? Are well, you going to train for the uh, – we, we That's should. all the time we have. <laughs> yeah. Are you committing now to oh. training well for next year? You need to follow our strength bias path. Yeah, I, I actually plan to. Yeah, I think for most people following that sounds fun too. Yeah. strength bias, uh, also this year they're putting gymnastic strength into the strength bias. Can we change our name of our path to strength? Strength, strength, strength path? It. I still feel like it's normal when I say <laughs> it. In New York – that's how people say it. It's like people who say coffee. What is the other word y'all say? Uh, you and Evan both said y'all add tournament. Like, tournament. Add tournament. Tournament. What tournament? do you say? Tournament. Tournament. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Tournament. Y'all add like an ER to. It's New York. I think that's what something. it is. Yeah. You guys are weird. <laughs> no, you guys say string. <laughs> <laughs> I get a lot of shit for that. I feel like every freaking podcast I you know say how- the word or every time there's something about how strong you need to be, yeah. somebody mentions how I say it. I know you know I how like there's like all. a trend in like shirts that's like just one word with a period or something real big on the front. Mm. I always wanted mm. us to put out strength. How would you spell it? <laughs> strength. Uh, oh, that's a good question. There's two ways. You can either do S T R I N T H. Or strength? Do I say strength? <laughs> That's how someone wrote it. Or S T R. You just take the G E-N-T- out. N T. Yeah, you just take the G. Strength. Out. Yeah, yeah. yeah, it's more effective. What's the yeah. G in there for anyway? I don't know. Actually, do the y'all good. let us know. <laughs> strength. <laughs> in the comments below, how do you spell how Matt say it? Strength. Yeah. How do you spell that? <laughs> and is it the correct pronunciation? Because and do you I want it on a T-shirt? If I put it into Siri, if I said it to Siri, she understands what I'm saying. Should we ask Chat GPT? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh gosh. Uh, anything else? Um, Where do they get signed up for this shenanigans, Brandon? Go to trainingthinkthink.com, and then you can click on compete. Sign up right there. Check in the description. Also, put the um, group nutrition thing in the description as well. That's the thing you were trying to explain that I still don't understand? Yeah. It's basically (laughs) a... so for most is it people, specific to quarterfinals? It's, very, it's specific to quarterfinals. It's basically a four-week program that is designed the same way that the training program is designed to peak. A lot of people, they, like, they either have a nutrition coach or that type of stuff is just as important to get peaked. But as a lower cost option, we basically created a product that was uh, helping people stay accountable on the three major things that most people will miss out in their peaking cycle. Which so, hey, be, I haven't been taking this seriously. I, ha- I did just qualify top 25%. Help me. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And also help me stay accountable to the process. And again, it's not groundbreaking information where you're going to make these drastic changes to the way that you live, but it is an opportunity to have an outside person just help you with the basic things that you're doing outside the gym, the same way that Brandon would help with the things that you're doing inside the gym. So it's basically a a habit tracking system for you to take care of those habits in the same way that you would training for the four weeks leading into competition. Yeah. And, and by the way, those things matter just as much. Like if you are going out on the weekend, staying up super late, drinking a ton of alcohol, you're not going to sleep well, you're not recovering well, you go into the next day and then you can't train the way that you want to, that's going to impact your training and recovery. And then you're not going to be peaked for quarterfinals the way that you want. So you could, you could take the training seriously, but if you're not tra- taking the recovery seriously, you're, you're just digging yourself a hole. Yeah. And if you take the training seriously without recovering, I think Generally speaking, you're more likely to get injured or not be peaked on game day. So, again, it was our opportunity to try to push people to be like, hey, if you're going to take it seriously now, this is something that you would want to take as seriously as the training side of it. Dang, I might just to stay accountable. All right. Well, this was our first podcast in a long time. We've been doing the 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 reacts. reacts. Yep. And we'll have a 23 point. See, I did it again. 24. 24. (laughs) Not once this whole open have I said the right year. Um, Sometimes I said 17. (laughs) 17 points? I would say 17.1. I'm like, like, why did I do that? Um, But what else we got coming up? We got Jeff Cordero. Yeah. We filmed the episode after he won the. Oh, when is that coming out? I don't know. Next week, week, probably. He gave it. So he has, if you haven't heard us talk about this in the reacts, he. He is on a pit crew for a NASCAR uh, cup team, and uh, he's also a bow hunter. So those are both high-pressure things, and he teaches some lessons he's learned through that. And he also competes in CrossFit, too. Yeah, so some good stories How you can take there. some of that high-pressure stuff and apply it to CrossFit. 
By the way, I just followed him on Instagram. I feel kind of guilty saying that because I've known him for a really long time. But he popped asshole. up and I was like, oh, I got to follow him. And he had a real good hype video of him training inside the gym with a sandbag here. Oh, I yeah. commented yeah. on it. Yo, what's crazy is, uh, so they won the Daytona 500. And did you watch the NASCAR Netflix show? I've watched two episodes, so I feel the like. The driver, uh, William Byron of yeah. the 24 car that he works on, um, he's a big Lego guy. And I guess right now they're in cahoots talking to Lego to get the first ever like commemorative Daytona 500 oh, victory. That'd be sweet. And so Jeff, it, they're all going to look like generic little yellow <laughs> uh, Lego man, but he would, he'll have a Lego guy. Yeah, he'll have a Lego That's guy. That's sweet. All right. Cool. See, See you, boys. See y'all.